Well, it is 1030. So I would like to welcome everyone or welcome people back if you are rejoining us. I'm Dr. Nancy Love. I coordinate the Humanities Council. And we are now beginning our second session in our webinar, People, Politics, and Representation, produced by AppTV. I would like to introduce Dr. David Russell, who is a member of the Humanities Council and an assistant professor of sociology. And he will introduce his co-interviewer, um, our interviewee, and facilitate the next session. Thank you for joining us, everyone. Thank you so much, Nancy. I am, I'm really beyond delighted to introduce our, our, next, our next speaker, Dr. Jennifer Hirsch. Uh, Dr. Hirsch is professor of sociomedical sciences at the Mailman School of Public Health at Columbia University. Her research spans five intertwined domains, including the anthropology of love, gender, sexuality, and migration, sexual reproductive and HIV risk practices, social scientific research on sexual assault and undergraduate well-being, as well as the intersections between anthropology and public health. She's been named one of New York City's 16 heroes in the fight against gender-based violence. And in 2012, she was selected as a Guggenheim Fellow. And today, the, the subject of our, our conversation will be on uh, Dr. Hirsch's book, Sexual Citizens. Sexual Citizens is a, a landmark study of sex, power, and assault on campus. And Sexual Citizens transforms how we understand and address one of the most misunderstood problems on college campuses, widespread sexual assault. And through intimate port portraits of life and sex among today's college students, Jennifer Hirsch and Seamus Khan show us how sexual assault is a public health crisis. They present an entirely new way to understand sexual assault, focusing on its social roots. And uh, co-facilitating this interview with me is my colleague in the Department of Sociology at Appalachian State, Dr. Martha McCoy. And Martha McCoy is a, a professor of sociology with research interests that intersect gender intersect gender, sexuality, technology, violence, and privacy. She's been at Appalachian since 2003. And she's also a, an expert in sexual assault prevention and is the author of the book, Real Knockouts, a, a book on women's self-defense movement, as well as articles on self-defense as a form of primary prevention in the CDC's ecological model of violence prevention. So we're going to use a interview format for today's uh, symposium event. And I, I'm gonna go ahead and kind of kick off a set of questions for Dr. Hirsch. And Dr. McCoy and I will kind of uh, switch off one another. And so I would like to start off just by uh, wondering, you know, Dr. Hirsch, if you could, your book focuses on the problem of campus sexual assault. And would you mind introducing this, this issue to our audience? And what, when you first started exploring the problem of campus sexual assault, what, what did we kind of know about this problem uh, when you started the project? And, and how did you see your work as contributing to this body of knowledge? Uh, thank you for that question. And before I start, I just want to thank you for, for having me with you in this virtual space. Um, I'm so sorry I can't be with you in person. Um, as we were talking about in the break, it would have been great to go hiking together. And also, uh, my co-author, Seamus, is not well, and so I'm repping. Um, the good thing is that um, over the course of writing and the book tour, we've achieved Vulcan mind meld. So we are essentially the same person. So. Um, uh, I'll, I'll manage to, to represent us uh, reasonably well. So I actually, I want to start with a story because the book is, is grounded in student stories and I want viewers to come away with a flavor of what it feels like to read the book. Um, so Austin was um, in many ways such an engaging interview subject. He, um, he was a, a junior when we interviewed him and he 
the story of Austin and his girlfriend on a hot summer night is it's kind of like the only really steamy sex scene in the book. I'm not going to describe it. Just leave it to people's imagination. Um, it was the 4th of July. They made their own fireworks. Um, <laughs> and he, you know, he had developed actually nicknames for the kinds of orgasms that his girlfriend had. So he was not just a good boyfriend, but like a really committed lover and saw that as part of being a good boyfriend. Um, to be attentive to his girlfriend's uh, sexual needs and to satisfy them. And yet in that interview, he also told us a story um, about something that he initially described as a weird experience. And um, he was, it was early in his freshman year, uh, his roommate had a girlfriend and wanted to be alone with her. And since roommates infrequently get singles, Austin was shuffled off into the roommate's girlfriend's room where uh, there was a girl in bed. And as he came into the room, she mumbled um, that she didn't want to do anything. And like, that's a weird thing that when a stranger comes into your room, you should have to tell them not to touch your body, right? That should be understood. And yet like somehow in the sexual assault opportunity structure that dorms are, she felt like she needed to articulate that. And, and nevertheless, um, he got in bed with her and he started to touch her body. And then he stopped himself as he described and was like, nah, this isn't the thing. And so he clearly was troubled by that. And later in the interview, when we asked him what a sexual assault was, he stopped and um, his eyes welled up with tears. And he was like, you know, he just, he said a sexual assault is when you touch someone or, or do anything sexual without their consent. So like he had the information and, and then he was like, fuck me. Like he was really wrecked that by the thought that he had been that person and he had become someone else. And, and that memory of, of who he had been and what he had done, um, he uh, felt a great deal of remorse. And um, so s sexual citizens ask the question, what can we do um, to prevent things like that from happening, most of the public conversation, and I know that, you know, Martha knows this um, with her focus on primary prevention, most of the public conversation around sexual assault has been, at least on campuses, about adjudication, about how we can get adjudication right. And that's really important. Um, I want a little bit stay in my lane as a social scientist and not a lawyer, but such a tiny proportion of cases are ever reported that even if we got adjudication right, um, you know, that, that that's not going to solve the problem. We can't punish our way out of it. And the other sort of circulating idea about sexual assault um, in 2014, when we started this project, was about campuses as hunting grounds. Um, and what that gets right is that sexual assault is a very common, troublingly common part of a campus experience. And what, get, what that gets wrong is that it's mostly not a stranger hiding behind a bush to jump out at you. That does happen, um, but the the preponderance of incidents of campus sexual assault happen between people who know each other, some of whom are even in a relationship. And so I had spent my whole career, I hadn't been a sexual assault researcher. I've, I've worked on a basic social science around gender and sexuality as it relates to public health. And so looked at the social production of sexual behavior. In my work on HIV, I've talked about how we can't, we can't do prevention one penis at a time. We have to go upstream. And, and, and so I, I wanted to apply this same optic to campus sexual assault to really understand how it was socially produced so that we can think about what is it about the environment that we need to modify. I was very lucky that Columbia um, funded this sort of moonshot level project, which involved my, my co-PI, uh, Claude Ann Mellons, who's a clinical psychologist, eight faculty, staff of 30, and we were able to put together sort of a moonshot level project to, um, uh, to think about, okay, what produces this and what can we change? Okay, thanks. I'm gonna take the next turn. Um, Jennifer, just want to say, I think that I'm glad you started with that story because the, I say that one of the real strengths of this book is the stories that you gathered from college students about their sex lives, um, the highs and lows, the pleasures and the pain. And um, I think it's, it's so clear that anybody struggling to find a solution to the problem of campus sexual violence has got to start with that kind of intimate knowledge of today's 
college students' sex lives. And, and they've also got to approach it the way you do, which is with a real compassion and not judgment or scorn. And I think that it's such a, a good model for how to approach this problem. And your book just does that so successfully. So um, really appreciate that. Um, and you introduce in the book three primary concepts. One of, is, of course, the title of the book, Sexual Citizens, and the other two are Sexual Projects and Sexual Geographies. Could you, for those who haven't read the book yet, and I hope you will go out and read it if you haven't read it yet, everyone, but could you define those three concepts and tell us how those concepts help us understand the, project, the problem of sexual assault on campus? Sure, thank you, Martha. That's that's a great question. Um, and I actually, I'm gonna refer back to Austin's story to sort of ground us um, uh, empirically in, in, in how those concepts play out in students' lives. So sexual citizenship is the idea that um, people, including young people, have the right to choose their own sexual experiences and need to understand that other people have that, that concomitant right. And so in that moment, Austin was um, obviously choosing what he thought was a sexual experience, but totally unaware of that other person's humanity and right to assert her boundaries. And in fact, like very inattentive because she asserted her boundaries and he ignored them. So he was um, transgressing her sexual citizenship. I think that the, the, you know, the idea of sexual citizenship is also a little bit of a provocation to American policymakers and parents who have consistently negated young people's sexual citizenship. I, so a, a thing that we argue in the book is that we can't address the problem of campus sexual assault without acknowledging that young people are going to have sex and we can be doing more to help them do that in ways that don't hurt other people. Um, sexual projects asks the question, what is sex for? And you might think that that is like, here we are in a humanities symposium, like only an academic would ask what sex is for, because we all know it's like for pleasure or for babies, but none of the students that we spoke with were interested in making babies at that moment. And a lot of the sex that they described was not very pleasurable. Mm -hmm. And so by lifting up or sort of uncovering through the stories, the range of things that students are trying to do with sex, um, we get insight into how they get into situations where they hurt other people or where they are vulnerable to being hurt. So like think about Austin. In that moment, his sexual project, which is a very common one early in freshman year, was accruing sexual experience. He was very he, anxious. He had gone to an all boys school. He didn't know a lot of girls. He didn't know a lot about girls. And he felt like he was behind. He felt like he should have lost his virginity in high school. And he really wanted just to like have sexual interactions to practice and, and to um, as one of the, can I be like, can I use students words in this conversation? I mean, like there was a student in, in, in the book who described himself as wanting to learn to give good dick, right? So like students really want to learn to be good at sex. And that is a, a prominent sexual project. Um, other sexual projects that students have, you know, occasionally, like we see in the later version of Austin, it's sharing intimacy and experiencing and giving pleasure. Frequently, it's accruing status. Um, and for queer students in particular, um, sex is a terrain in which they figure out who they are. So they sort of locate themselves in terms of their identity. Um, and then sexual geographies, um, which in some ways is the concept that points the most to what campuses could be doing differently, um, is how space uh, produces uh, both sexual interactions and opportunities for assault. So, you know, in that story I told about Austin, if freshmen had singles, he wouldn't have been shuffled off into someone else's bedroom. And so you can see how the assumption that upperclassmen get better housing than freshmen is actually part of what creates situations in which assault is more likely to happen. Um, we're not, I mean, as you said, Martha, like we really try to stand, we, 
there are things that people do that are wrong and harmful. And we don't withhold judgment on that, but we do try to hold the students who's told us their stories with a lot of compassion. And so you can see that moment where Austin touched that girl's body, like he did something wrong, no question. But also there was a way in which the environment created that opportunity. And so if we modify the environment, we could uncreate those opportunities. So those are the three grounding concepts. Thank you. Um, so who do you who do you feel are the main audiences or groups that the book is trying to reach and i'll just throw out a few hypotheticals um, because i can see how it so many groups would get something out of this book anti-sexual assault activists and organizations um, scholars doing research on sexual assault and prevention campus staff who manage the sexual assault prevention education through title IX offices orientation programs or deans of students offices or college students themselves, or maybe even um, parents of young people or the Department of Education. So who, who did you really feel were the main audiences as you were writing this? And, um, and just as a follow up from that, what, what do you feel is the book's main message for each of those main audiences? Um, everyone. I mean, you know, I, I, a message in, in Sexual Citizens is that campus sexual assault is not a campus problem. It's an everyone problem. And that means that we need to reimagine who the stakeholders are in creating solutions. So um, certainly like the book has landed with a lot of resonance. I mean, every day survivors reach out to us to say that like they feel so seen, that we told their story. And, and those like now starting to cry. I, I find that very meaningful to like, get that kind of affirmation from from survivors themselves. Um, uh, I think scholars like it, it, to to sexual assault researchers, the idea of using the ecological model is not new. It's just that that hasn't been where there's been a lot of policy uptake. So we're we're delighted to be in conversation with scholars. Um, and the thing that's holding the world back from being a better place is not more research right? It's changing the conversation. And so our goal with Sexual Citizens is, was really to change the public conversation about sexual assault, to bring more people into being part of the solution. So certainly um, at the campus level, uh, I think for, for particularly the recommendations around modifying space um, is a message that we have. Like our, our A-game in public health is not to yak at people to act better, right? It's to transform the environment. Think about clean water. So like, what is the clean water solution to sexual assault? Um, and just to unpack that a little bit for people who are not familiar with public health, like when the water comes out of the tap, you don't have to boil it mostly, you just drink it and you don't die of diarrhea. And like, that's a miracle. Like we worked really hard in public health to create the infrastructure to make that happen. And so what would it look like to build, to reimagine campuses in a way where there are fewer assaults because it's a, diff it's a different physical environment. Um, so certainly um, we wanna be in dialogue both with campus administrators who, are, who don't consider themselves sexual, part of the sexual assault prevention team and with people who, you know, the Title IX offices and people who do orientation planning. We, we've been delighted, for example, that Stanford and Cornell have both integrated sexual citizens into their orientation and sexual assault prevention work. But it feels to me like one of the biggest wins, um, the, the vice president for housing and dining at Columbia, who is a great guy and had never thought of himself as part of sexual assault prevention in conversation with the broader research team decided to keep one of the cafeterias open all night. And so like that, it's not like French fries at 3 a.m. by itself is going to prevent every sexual assault. But if you have, you know, when the bars close, you have drunk students funneled back into rooms where the old, there's a desk, a dresser, a desk chair and a bed. And so like they end up sitting on the bed, even if one of them doesn't want something sexual. And so that is, I'm not, not judgy about the bed and like people should do what they want, but having another um, space available is part of building a safer context. And so I think bringing people in 
so that they can imagine how it, like he was so excited when we could see like literally see the light bulb go off above his head when he was like oh yeah i can be part of the solution so we want to bring in um what people in public health call like a multi-sectoral group of, of administrators people who all everyone who shapes the campus experience um and then students themselves and parents i mean it's I, a number of um people have told me that they've been they read the book with their child before they go off to college and i think you know like we're the sex ed family so like my kids have been talking about sex since they could talk because but not every family is a sex ed family and if you are not reading sexual citizens with your child provides like a little bit of a less charged way to talk about these issues because you could talk about someone else's experiences and and what you think about them um and i think that you know parents have an important values formation role to play in terms of what young people's sexual projects are you can't impose a sexual project any more than you can like get your kid to floss their teeth right which i have tried so many times and failed at but but you can lift up what you think of as better and worse sexual projects and ultimately like there is a lot of research that shows that parents are the people who form their their children's moral worlds and so i think stepping like we we want to provide scaffolding for parents to step up step up and take on that that conversation um so it really is it's a, it's an everyone book wow thank you so much jennifer i i wanted to follow up i you started the the interview with the story and i thought that was a great way to kind of open up the conversation and and martha mentioned that the, the stories are really kind of one of the strengths of this book and so i wanted to follow up as and and a lot of these stories come from your ethnographic work um, and that really represents the the primary sort of research uh design and focus of your your methods so i, w I wondered if you could and and through this research you you interviewed and observed uh student college students so I, I wondered if you could kind of tell us a little bit more about the research process um how, how you developed the how you kind of chose the study design and sure i mean um it, it was an unusual opportunity to you know i it started with my sidling up to the vice president um for uh, uh, for student life, who is responsible for the, the university response for gender based misconduct. And so I think shout out to like high level feminist leadership for having the vision to support us. And so, and I said to Suzanne Goldberg, I'm like, I have an idea for doing a little, I, I, I framed this initially as like a small ethnographic study. So like, you know, a little bit of participant observation and she was really supportive and she's like, okay, make me a pitch. And, um, so we went for it. I, I brought in my my friend and colleague Claude N. Mellons, who's a clinical psychologist, and we assembled a ginormous technical term project um, that had three different components. So there was a um, ethnographic research component about which more in a minute. Um, there were two forms of survey research, and then there was a community collaborative component because at any university um you know there is a special shelf somewhere with binders full of recommendations that have been ignored and it was not our goal to produce another binder of recommendations and so we had two um main advisory boards one comprised of undergraduates who um represented the diversity of undergraduate student experiences at barnard and columbia and we actually paid them so that it wouldn't just be the rich ones who could afford to donate their time and they met with us every monday morning at 8 a.m to to oversee and to provide us with feedback on the instruments and and help with sampling and that was um one of just the most delightful aspects of what was a really hard project to carry out and then we had a group of administrators with whom we were in conversation from the beginning um using what researchers call community-based participatory research where like you don't tell people what to do you tell them what you're finding and then you're in conversation with them about the horizon of the possible in terms of change and so that conversation and that bi-directional flow of information from the beginning was really fundamental to the bigger project with the sexual health initiative to foster transformation or shift um, and the work that we present that Seamus and I present in sexual citizens is really mostly from the what we call ethnographic research so ethnography 
um, is a deep dive into how, co how a community experiences its own life. And so to do that, um, Seamus and I were, are, you know, we go to bed at 930. We're like not the people who are like right to observe undergraduate social life. And plus it would be super awkward to see a professor, like we're not welcome at a party. Like we, we knew that up front. And so we hired um, a team of younger researchers. We, there were five of them and they were, they had masters and PhD level training and they were very diverse in terms of their own backgrounds. And um, they spent time immersed in, in undergraduate life and not just at parties, cause like that's only one slice of the everyday. They went to religious services and they rode the bus to the athletic fields and had hung out in the dorms while people were getting ready for parties and, and just chilled, played Settlers of Catan, like the things that people do, um, they did alongside the students. Um, and that was complemented by in-depth interviews with 151 students. And those interviews were intense. Um, 25 of the students actually had to do a second or even a third interview because they had experienced so many assaults that, that it couldn't be contained in one story. So the interviews were about students sex lives, but also, you know, we asked about that first and about their experiences of assault. Um, one thing that is unusual about the book is that um, we include the voices of assaulters in that. I mean, there were students who thought they were having sex and were assaulting someone. And so we get some insight into one kind of assaulter, obviously not the people who intentionally harm people, but the people who, who unintentionally through entitlement and self-absorption harm people. Um, and then we did other things that, that um, uh, anthropologists and sociologists do. So we had focus groups and we interviewed people who consider themselves experts in, um, in undergraduate student life. But sort of all together what the book does is, and this is why it's so great for parents, is it, it pulls back the curtain on what it feels like to be a college student. Um, and not just in terms of sex and sexual assault, but in terms of the stress and the suffering and how hard it is to leave home. Um, so like the, the um, sort of the affective texture of everyday life. And clearly, you know, Columbia and Barnard are very particular in some ways, but leaving home at age 18, like has those same fears everywhere. And I think it's important to acknowledge that the majority of college students in America go to community colleges and live at home. Um, and still, I think there are some ways in which our findings in sexual citizens are relevant to that. So anyway, that, that's sort of, that was a deep dive into the research methods. Maybe that was more than you wanted. That was great. Thank you. Um, I want to talk about a specific student story in your book, and I think it illustrates the concepts of sexual citizens, sexual projects, and sexual geography. So I'll um, mention the story, and then maybe you can um, tell us more about that, what that story illustrates about the skills that young adults often lack and how the gaining those skills might help prevent sexual assault. And this is a story of Diana, the woman who was determined to get her close male friend who was gay to have sex with her. And she basically tells you how she plotted to score with him. She saw him like a frog she'd put in warm water and whom she'd eventually turn up the heat so that he wouldn't really realize what was happening and wouldn't realize he needed to jump out or get out of there. Um, Diana was fixated on what she wanted um, and not on what her friend wanted. The story really illustrates, I think, a number of points in your book. First, that women can be the aggressors and men can be the targets of that aggression, not just the other way around, even if it is more often the other way around. Um, it also uh, illustrates the point about sexual citizenship um, and how that's missing here. Diana did not respect her friend. Um, he was the object of a conquest to boost her ego. So um, that, that, that illustrated that. And again, I want you to elaborate on all this, but, um, and sexual geography seem to be at work here too, in that Diana set up a situation at her place to bring her friend over, um, some would say sort of lure him over for this goal that she had in mind set up in advance that he didn't know about. And then further, Diana had already been educated in the concept of affirmative consent. 
So she worked out a yes, if you will, um, or coerced a yes might be the better way of putting it. So uh, from this man who she wanted to have sex with. So there, and there's, this is of course, one of countless stories in your book that illustrate this. So I just want to invite you to, to talk about that and um, tell us about this, the skills that were missing here and that need to be developed. Yeah, and that interview with Diana, um, it broke my heart into a million tiny pieces. I mean, it, I think that Diana's story starts um, in high school where she describes wanting to get good at sex and doing so by setting up hookups with men she didn't know in hotel rooms where she was very clear she didn't want to have intercourse and she wouldn't respond to men who sent her dick pics or, or couldn't put together a grammatically correct sentence. So she was you know, clear sort of about what she was looking for. And she was emphatic that she didn't want to have intercourse. She just wanted to practice sex. And so I think she, she came to college with the idea of sex as a thing you do to someone rather than a thing you do with someone. And then even, so, so her sexual project, you know, in, in, that, in those high school years had been um, becoming a skilled sexual partner, but in a way that doesn't, that fails to acknowledge that it's a partner specific activity, right? That people might like different things and that the skill is listening, not like technique. Um, and then she had, a, you know, another experience that she had uh, freshman year, she was running with a sort of rich, fast crowd and they would get together at brunch and pass pictures around of who they'd gotten with. And so she had this like super creepy experience where she was at a party and all of a sudden she was left alone with this upperclassman and he instructed her to take off her clothes and you know, he was, a, he was a senior, she was a freshman, so she did what he said. She took off her clothes, she gave him a blowjob, they had sex. Um, then as she left, she saw that his friend had been listening at the door. So like, she was, she felt humiliated and used and gross about it. And it's the kind of thing that, that students describe as rapey. Um, like maybe not actually assault, but certainly disturbing. And yet the next morning, she said, I had a good chit. Like she passed his his picture around at brunch because in that interaction like she decided that she was going to reinterpret what had been humiliating as status producing and so the, the the third story that we tell about diana which you share and this is why i love being in conversation with fellow academics because they give such a good close read to the book so that story like you can see that her sexual project was seeing herself as so powerfully sexy that she could move someone down the Kinsey scale. She was unaware of him as a self-determining sexual citizen. And so what's missing, what was missing all along in Diana was um, growing up in a world that had helped her learn to see other people's sexual citizenship. So she was very aware of like, which not all women are, of her own sexual desires and the, the goal of realizing those desires, maybe not with pleasure, but at least with conquest. But she was not attentive to other people as people. And you know, I think that the opportunity, the prevention opportunity is to not see that as an individual failure, but to think, okay, where were the points where there could have been structures that taught her that? Right? And that's why we're such big proponents of comprehensive K through 12, medically accurate, age appropriate sexuality education, because that is um, a policy that can promote sexual citizenship, that can help young people see other people as having the right to sexual self-determination. I mean, one of the papers from the survey component, which, you know, shout out, uh, first author was my husband, John Santelli. So um, the, the data analysis found that young women who had had comprehensive sexuality education that included training in how to say no to sex they didn't want to have were half as likely to be raped in college. And other work that I've done suggests, and this is, I think, more to the point for what you asked, suggests that comprehensive sex ed can also reduce perpetration by helping people and mostly men understand that women have the right to sexual self-determination. So I think that like that is 
um, that is a gap that Diana's story points to. Um, I think there, there are other places we could, we could take this further, but I, I feel like that's the principal one. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, and, and that's another thing I appreciate about the book is that there are um, the sort of a trajectory that you can follow in some of the individual students and to see um, how their projects develop or change and how they're impacted by different things that happen to them. So that's, I'm glad you mentioned Diana's history there too. Um, so I wanna talk about one other story in case that brings up other gaps where we've failed to uh, teach young people certain skills. And this one is a story that one of your participants shared that comes up in chapter nine. Um, and that's the story of Cindy, a first year student who's taking a tour of an upperclassman's dorm room and he physically pins her down on his bed and rapes her. All the while, Cindy is saying no very clearly. Um, so Cindy seems like she's doing what the sexual citizenship approach would have her do. She's showing agency. She's aware that she doesn't want to have sex. She's making it very clear what her boundary is. Um, and she's doing a good job of that. But that didn't help her thwart the assault. So I'm, I, I'm wondering, does our, you know, does our culture fail to teach people like Cindy how to physically resist um, and that her physical resistance would likely be effective. Um, we know a number of studies show that physical resistance combined with verbal resistance are extremely effective in thwarting assaults. So um, studies like Charlene Sens, which I know you know of, um, show that when, when women train to defend themselves, they're far more likely to be able to stop the assault and that they're also less likely to even experience an assault. So what I saw in that story is somebody who didn't have the information on the efficacy of physical resistance or self-defense. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are on including self-defense and self-defense training as part of the model you're advocating for sexual assault prevention. Yes. Um, I mean, I, I think that in sexual citizens, we show that assault is not one thing, it's many things. And there's not gonna be one solution that can prevent all assaults. But, you know, the findings from Charlene Sen's work, that's really compelling. And like, how can we fail to include in our sexual assault prevention toolkit something that has been shown to be effective? And I think that what has hampered that are the politics around um, people, there, there are people who see self-defense training as intrinsically victim blaming and anti-feminist. Um, and I feel like we can do at least two things at the same time. So we can be teaching people to assert and defend their sexual boundaries while also teaching people not to rape each other, right? Like I think fundamentally the, the most of the assaults um, are committed by men. And in many instances, it's men who where their power is not just gendered power, but it's power related to age differences or control of physical space or um, their whiteness or their their physical size. Like so, so there's. I think that we could do a much better job. The person who assaulted Cindy, it is his fault, right? And so I think it's too easy to just say he's a terrible person because he did a terrible thing, right? I think that our, our job is to say he did a terrible thing and what needs to happen socially to teach people not to do that, right? And so the most charitable interpretation that we could give, which I think is really too charitable in this case, is that he felt like women just say no, right? That he believed all those rape myths and he thought that that's how people, that that's how sex was. But I think that beyond that, like, maybe he was truly unaware of his power and how intimidating it is to be with a senior. So I think that there are lots of things that we can be doing better to teach men not to rape women, right? Like, and I think as parents, we can be doing better at that. I, you know, um, I'm really gonna call out religious organizations here. You are, the goal with most religious organizations has been for them to be spaces 
that are not spaces of danger for sexual assault. And that's a pretty low bar for organizations where supposedly their mission is to create good human beings. So like, why is every religious institution, like you wanna keep the kids in the pews, right? And so when they're teenagers, there is nothing that you could do that's more powerful than provide a faith-based conversation about what it means to be a good person sexually. Um, so I think that, you know, the coaching boys into men is another intervention that's been shown to be effective. So I think that, you know, in the way that with HIV prevention, um, we've seen this idea of combination prevention, where you layer together individual level interventions and community level interventions and modifications to space and policy changes. Like there, is, there are so many things that we could do if we brought together all the stakeholders. And so I think that really there are a lot of things that we could be doing better. There still are gonna be people who intentionally harm other people. I think those are the ones that are hardest. Like for me as a public health person, I feel like that's outside my area of expertise, the people who are intentionally harming other people. But the people who are unintentionally harming other people, like we don't let kids drive without training, right? Like they don't just grab the keys and go out and you're like, oh, I hope that goes okay for them, right? Instead, there's a whole structure. And I, I both of my sons have just learned to drive. And so I, I like feel how terrifying it was to teach them. But there, so there are structures in place to teach young people to do that very dangerous behavior in a way that doesn't hurt other people where they can still get where they're going. Um, and I feel like we're failing. Young people are gonna get where they wanna go. They're gonna have sex. And we're failing to create an environment in which they can learn to do so without hurting other people. That's on us. That's on all of us. Well, thank you so much, Jennifer. I, I, I think this kind of conversation leads really well into our next question, which you mentioned interventions at the individual, the community, the policy levels, and structural factors. And I think one of the strengths of social science research and anthropology, sociology, is the, the way in which we kind of bring in theoretical models to help us understand problems. And one of the models that you draw on in your research is the ecological model. And would you mind just for our audience kind of describing this model and how, how does it kind of help us understand sexual assault and sexual assault prevention? And what are some of the forms of prevention that fall within the ecological model? And would there be an example of a sexual assault prevention strategy that maybe you would not count as primary prevention in the ecological model? And um, why wouldn't that be primary prevention? So I guess just like two definitions for people who are not super ex like for whom this is these are new words so the ecological model which is not my invention it's a sort of like a classic of um not even social science but behavioral science that is frequently used in public health basically posits that like someone's whole environment including their life course so their their childhood every like everything that that creates someone's world is relevant and modifiable um in relation to problem x whether it's like heart disease or sexual assault so it's it's a, it's a way of including things beyond the individual and even beyond the interpersonal in thinking about what we could be trying to change uh, for prevention. So that's the ecological model. And primary and secondary prevention. Primary prevention is keeping something from happening before it happens. So like primary prevention for COVID would be wearing your fucking mask, right? So like you don't get other people sick. Um, uh, secondary prevention for COVID would be staying at home when you are sick so you don't get, you know, so that you don't continue to infect other people. So, um, excuse me for the F-bomb there, but uh, so um, in terms of sexual assault, I think some forms of prevention that fall within the ecological model, think back to that dining hall, right? So like um, thinking about modifying space, um, is I think an important, like that's a population level form of intervention that can give 
uh, students on campus another place to be together so that they don't have to go into a sexualized space if they don't both desire it. Um, other, another form of prevention, uh, like the, one of the things I like about the ecological model is the life course perspective we found, and this, you know, uh, goes along with what, what CDC finds in their data, that there are substantial rates of sexual assault in high school. And so college, it's not that it's too late, but it is a little too late, right, for some people. And so um, thinking about, I, I know I said this already, but I am a big proponent, um, comprehensive sexuality education, like when, which at kindergarten, it doesn't, it's not about like ovaries and, 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 and penises in kindergarten. In kindergarten, literally, it is about learning to keep your hands on your own body. Right, which is like obviously there are many public figures who never got that memo. So, um, so, so, so comprehensive K through twelve sex ed includes healthy relationship training, and so it would help people. Um, it would help the person who hurt Cindy understand that that's not that sex is not about conquest. That you can't do that to someone else. That that's rape. Um, so, and then there are things. I think one of the the hard things about the the legally driven compliance adjudication framework that um, most campuses have is that there's no feedback loop. And so people who are hurting other people sexually, people who are assaulting people, like Eddie, for example, Eddie told us this story that started out, I knew I was gonna have sex because I put on a tie. And then he described an evening that ended up with him as he described it, having sex with a girl as she went in and out of consciousness. And I read that transcript and I'm like, that's not sex, that's rape. And so th there's no feedback loop. Like we actually interviewed, we mostly didn't interview dyads, but we actually interviewed that young woman and she described being assaulted, but she talked about a different assault. She didn't describe what happened with Eddie as an assault. And he, there, so there was, and so he never, no one ever told him that what he did was an assault. So there's no feedback loop. And I think people, it shouldn't be the burden of survivors to tell people, to tell their assaulters that they're hurting people. But there's no way that people, there's no, there's no way that people who are hurting other people can learn to do better. And so, and I think that the adjudication system, because um, it's such a hard hammer, uh, doesn't necessarily invite those kinds of conversations. One of the things that is exceptional about that story with Diana assaulting her friend is that they did talk about it afterwards. And she said, did I rape you? And he was like, yeah, kinda. Um, and it was very, and then she went into therapy. And like, when I, when I interviewed her, she described herself as asexual. Like she was still working through what she, felt was the harm that she had caused, but that is the exception, not the rule. Most people who hurt other people, they just keep going on doing it. Um, and it's not not in like a serial perpetrator way, but they, they just, they don't know, in the same way that like there are really bad drivers out there, but someone takes their license away, but like no one is taking these people's licenses away. And so I think we need a system, um, you know, and my expertise is not in restorative justice, but we are generally like that seems like a way forward. There needs to be some way for people who hurt each other, who for people who hurt other people to acknowledge the harm they've done, to try to do what they can, um, if possible, to um, not make it right, but at least to acknowledge it. And, and then for them to learn not to hurt other people. So that's a, that's a big gap, I think, on a lot of campuses. Thank you very much. Um, so I, I think that you, you've already described how the ecological model invites this kind of both and approach to finding solutions and to looking at solutions that we can engage in at all levels, individual, social, policy level. Um, so given that there are so many solutions, um, I still wanna ask you about a couple of specific ones. <laughs> um, in terms of what would be really effective for preventing campus sexual assault. Um, it, towards the end of the book, you propose a tax on pornography and liquor companies because they're making billions of dollars while 
you could argue that they're a fallout from the um, uh, from purchasing those things and what what they profit from is sexual assault. Um, so I want to ask you to tell tell us about that argument, and then also about the Federal Office on Violence Against Women, which is set up unlike the pornography industry or the liquor industry to deal with the problem of violence against women. And they've in fact awarded over $6 billion in grants. Um, mostly, however, the Violence Against Women Office grants are going towards making survivors post abuse lives more tolerable with counseling or shelter, for example, and going toward making perpetrator, perpetrators post abuse lives more punishing, making sure they get arrested and jailed and so forth. So um, I'm curious why not argue that we repurpose some of the money that the Violence Against Women Office is awarding so that it can go toward more upstream solutions to the problem. So kind of asking you two separate questions rolled into one there. <laughs> I mean, one thing that I've learned and, and that makes me a little sad over my the course of my career in public health is that most of the the most public health problems um, have upstream drivers that are outside the control of public health. And so that leads to this idea of what economists call externalities, where people, where there are sectors, private, parts of the private sector that profit um, in a way that causes downstream uh, health harm. So the classic idea of an externality is a factory that makes something and pollutes in the river and people downstream in the river get sick from that pollution and the factory um, can price their item, their widget in a way that doesn't account for the suffering they cause. And so, you know, I'm all about growing the pie and I think holding the private sector responsible a little bit. So I, I think that's, um, I'm not sure it's a practicable solution, but I we just wanted to call out the fact that there, there is, there are people who are profiting or industries that are profiting um, that could grow the pie um, of prevention funding. And I think in particular, you know, I'm, I'm on the New York State coalition that is trying to pass sex, comprehensive sexuality education legislation at the state level. And as our schools are countenancing having to lay off teachers because of the COVID crisis, it's gonna be a heavy lift to get funding appropriated to hire more teachers to teach sex ed when there literally are like not enough teachers to teach English and math. And so I think thinking about new revenue streams is important. But a second um, part of why I think OVW, like OVW is not my main area of expertise. And I think that I just want to talk a little bit about intersectionality because that's not something that we've brought up. Um, every single one of the Black women that we spoke with had experienced unwanted sexual touching. Um, every single one. And so those assaults on their physical autonomy are not just about sexual violence, they're also about racism and about the disregard with which Black women's bodies are held in the world. And so I think that that um, a framing of sexual violence only within a rubric of violence against women misses out on um, the intersection of sexual violence with racism, it misses out on the intersection of sexual violence with the everyday discrimination that queer people experience in the world. And so I think that expanding, I mean, I am excited for what a Biden administration can do in terms of sexual violence prevention, but it has to go beyond gender. And I mean, that's the, that's the conceptual argument in the book is that building on the sort of it, the, the fundamental feminist analysis of sexual violence as being about gender, we have to look at the many other forms of power inequality. You know, queer students across campuses face the highest rates of sexual violence. And it's not the football team that's doing that, right? It's mostly other, I mean, it's not, not the football team, but it's mostly other queer students. And so I think to understand what produces those vulnerabilities, 
you need an intersectional framework that looks at um, things that that build on gender, but but go beyond it. And so I think that we. Oh, and one more thing that I would say is that under President Carter. Um, there was a center at NIH, and Martha, you probably know this, there was a center at NIH that was actually dedicated to funding research on sexual violence, and that was defunded under President Reagan. And so I think that the, like, why did we do, make so much progress in breast cancer? Because there was a lot of money for it, right? And so it's not just that we need more money for programs, it's that there needs to be a dedicated stream of funding for prevention research. The only reason we could do this at Columbia is because Columbia is rich and a trustee like wrote a personal check. So that's not happening on most campuses. And so for us all to make progress, we need, we need better funding for our research. Thank you so much, Jennifer. I, I want to just pause for a second and uh, we, um, Martha and I have a few more questions, but I, I want to actually invite the audience to submit any questions that they have for Dr. Hirsch to the uh, Q&A box. And uh, uh, we will share your questions um, sort of towards the end of the, we'll, we'll definitely leave some time to have some audience questions. So please feel free to ask, ask a question and uh, we'll, we'll pose it to the, to the speaker. So I, I wanted to, uh, I think you've elaborated on some of this, but I wanna kind of turn to solutions uh, to the problem of campus sexual assault. And um, in your book, you talk a lot about educating individuals as a way to address sexual violence um, and that but that's not enough um, and your your public health approach or ecological model means that we must place the individual in the context of their interpersonal relationships their institutional environment and the cultural context and you, you say we need to provide opportunities for students to clarify their own sexual projects give them guidance about thinking about sexual intimacy and respect and developing a sense of self-determination and respect for the same in other people. And you advocate for programming that provides opportunities for young people to reflect critically on how they can enact those sexual projects in a way that's grounded in respect for sexual citizenship, both their own as well as for others. And for reflection on interpersonal and intergroup power dynamics and skills building around talking, listening, and interpreting nonverbal cues and body language. Um, so I wonder, are there also structural institutional policy changes? You mentioned you're kind of looking forward to what the Biden administration might do. So what sorts of policy changes, institutional changes, um, structural changes would kind of nudge people to make better decisions and avoid sexual assaults from occurring? Um, how can we go beyond the focus on like educating individuals? Right, because I, I think, and this is something like this search for the clean water approach to um, promoting sexual health is something that I've struggled with over the course of my career because I think that like it, sexual interactions ultimately happen between individuals and so it's hard to scale solutions in the same way as like building a whole water delivery system, right? And, and yet I think trying to like pushing ourselves <clears throat> to look upstream is, is is important not just as an intellectual challenge but because fundamentally our responsibility is to work at the population level because that is what's most impactful um so i think you know on campuses a thing that we could do is um leverage space i mean you know as fellow faculty members that there is no thing that campuses deploy that is more powerful than space. Like I have seen colleagues cry over being allocated a particular office, right? So whether it's faculty or students, like space is power. So we take for granted, and there's a real naturalization of the fact that upper class, you know, older students get better space. So I want party spaces that can be controlled by freshmen. And I want party spaces that can be controlled by queer students and students of color. Like I think, thinking, I'm not going to get into a whole thing about like abolishing fraternities or not abolishing fraternities, because that is not something that I am likely to be able to do. But I think that undercutting their power, like the part of their power rests in the fact that they can provide alcohol and organize social interactions in ways that other students can't. So like, fine, let's figure out a way to let other students do those things. So I think that like really thinking about how to 
reorganize campus dynamics in a way that will um, that can have a sort of leveling effect about the the uh, power the power inequalities that exist on campus is the most powerful thing that campuses can do. Um, and then I think that sex ed is not just about um, educating in individuals. I think that it does have like we I think. I would, I will own, I describe myself as on the left. We on the left have um, failed to acknowledge that sex ed is also a cultural project, right? It's about shifting norms at the broader sense. And so it's not just about like good education always teaches critical thinking and actual skills. Um, so yeah, sex ed shouldn't be about like ovaries and fallopian tubes. It needs to include healthy relationship uh, and, and like role playing, including refusal skills, but also helping people think like, you know, helping people understand that like when a girl says no to you, like, but that she actually doesn't want to go out with you. Like you don't need to keep asking. End of story. Um, so I think that is about changing. It's fundamentally about providing opportunities to reorganize masculinity right? For students to understand that intersectional analysis, for men to see, I think about the, some of the men who told, some of the men who figure as assaulters in the book um, seemed unaware of the social power they wielded. And so I think that helping men see, and I, I, feel, I feel this as the mother of two sons, that you can be a white cisgender heterosexual, wealthy man, and not be a bad person, and acknowledge that you wield a lot of social power that makes you, that puts you in a position to hurt someone, right? So like, that's not just, it is an individual consciousness raising process, but it's also a social project. Like, why are we having this Me Too moment where so many men seem fundamentally unaware that what they did was wrong? It's not just because of their individual brokenness. It's because of the need to reimagine masculinity in a way that is less violent. So I, so I do, um, I do see sex ed as as not just um, shifting individual behavior, but also as as shifting shared group norms. Thank you very much. And this is um, the last question, and then we can move to audience questions. But thinking about the institutional structures and um, space structures and other institutional level rules that nudge people away from um, committing sexual assault. Um, I want to talk about the history of universities because campuses used to completely control the environment and one of the way one of the outcomes was that perhaps sexual assaults were um, more under control, if you will. Um, they removed the, as you might put it, the sexual assault opportunity structure. Um, campuses used to have single sex dorms. They had rules against overnight visitors. They had curfews. Their parties were chaperoned. Um, and they even had rules prohibiting what they always called fornicating in dorms. So those, of course, were policies that have been removed and they were criticized as old fashioned, as infantilizing students, and even as sexist. But they were policies, I just want to acknowledge, that prevented students from committing sexual assault and that prevented students from becoming victims of sexual assault. Um, they may not have worked perfectly, but I mean that arguably they did remove that opportunity structure in large part. So, um, and those policies were, um, again, they, they can be criticized, but I'm curious, since the universities have relaxed all those prohibitions that protected students from sexual assault, the only real substitute so far is this kind of education and in, in, in affirmative consent, and then to put in place sort of post-abuse opportunities for adjudication, and you've already pointed out the problems with that. Um, what what would you say to people who say maybe we should go back to those older rules? What is there something wrong with those institutional rules, and how would you address that? Um, so, 
I think that young people, most young people in America have sex before marriage, right? And no matter what the rules are, like the rules are not going to prevent that from happening. What they're going to do is um, make it harder for students to um, seek help when they break those rules because they will feel like they've done something wrong. Think about, you know, the, the universities that, that, that do prohibit fornicating. Um, uh, they don't have a, a zero rate of sexual assault. I think fundamentally, going back to parietals, which is what those rules were called, um, is a denial of young people's sexual citizenship. I think that we need to, you know, I am a huge proponent for parents of the sleepover. Um, you know, which is when your child is in a relationship that um, they feel good about and um, they're at an age, you know, junior, senior in high school, um, like what we want is for our children to grow up and be able to have love and pleasure and intimacy and commitment like all in one package, right? And so why not affirm that by saying, yeah, you know, when you're in a relationship, if your partner is like wants to come have dinner with the family, they can stay for breakfast. And I mean, I will admit that was the most awkward cup of coffee I ever made. Like it is hard when your kids call you out on that. And at the same time, I feel like by doing that as a family, we have given them a clear values message about the sexual project that we value and that we, we you know, hope that they value. Um, and I, th I think that it's not workable for, I mean, I'm not opposed to single sex dorms if students want to be in single sex dorms, although it's also very heteronormative to assume that those are not also sexual assault opportunity structures, right? Um, but I, I don't think, I think fundamentally that is only, it only just, it just denies that young people are going to have sex. It doesn't, to me, lead us forward at all. I think that there is a spatial way forward, as I've indicated, through like changing party spaces and changing social spaces. And also, you know, in my imagined ideal freshman dorm, it's, you know, four single rooms and a living room so that students can have people over and socialize without having to bring them into their bedroom. Um, at Columbia, every single one of the lounges, like there's no couches, it's only armchairs. And I think that's because, you know, if it's a couch, then one person can monopolize the whole couch and space is very tight on campus. But it also means that it's hard to be with someone um, in a cozy way in a semi-public space, which again, funnels people back into bedrooms. And you know, Seamus and I are not judgy about sexual projects. Like people should live their best lives. I have clearly my own opinion about my kids' sexual projects, but I like our, but we're very judgy about sexual citizenship. The people that you are having sex with are people. And I think that is the fundamental message that we are failing to teach young people um, and failing to give them the tools to hear when other people assert their sexual citizenship. I don't know if that's a satisfying answer. That, that's, I mean, that's, it is a satisfying answer for me. I, I, so I wanted, I want to pose one of our first audience questions to you. It's from Sanjay. They ask, uh, how, how can perpetrators work with victims and take accountability? And how can campuses guide this? So, um, you know, my caution here is that restorative justice is really not my area of expertise. Um, I think the fundamental principle of working with survivors is that their agency has been violated. And so whatever happens needs to be led by what they want, right? Not every survivor wants to even name that they're a survivor, right? Part of, part of what we talk about in sexual citizens is, what, is that people sometimes reject labeling what happened to them as sexual assault. But for survivors who, who do see what happened to them as assault, 
some of them, what they want is to never be in the same room again with, with the person who harmed them. And so I think there's not going to be one way forward. I think that it's going to it's going to have to start with centering the experience of the person who was harmed. And, and, and taking our cues from them. And I think that you need people who are trained in restorative justice, which would not be me, but there are people for whom that is an area of expertise. Um, that, that's, um, thank, you, thank you for answering that, that question. I, um, we don't have another open audience question, but I wanted to ask, I, I had a question. I was wondering, um, what, do you, what are you guys doing next? Uh, where, uh, have, I know that research often sort of brings up a million new questions and do you, are you going to, is this an area where you, where you and Seamus are going to continue working in? And So there, there are two things that we're doing. I mean, um, the thing that stands between us and a better world is not more research. And we're really committed to the social life of the book. And that means it, using the book as a vehicle for policy change, hopefully in New York state, you know, there are nine states in America where by law, sex ed must be homophobic. It's called no promo homo. And if you're going to give sex ed, it can't say that it's okay to be gay. And so, and then there's just like this crazy patchwork, thank you federalism of state level laws. And so there's a lot of opportunity, Kentucky, Georgia, like states that you wouldn't necessarily think of are have, have sex ed at the state level on the legislative docket. And so we really want to be part of, um, of that policy translation work and use the book as a vehicle to help people think about what prevention might look like and the ways in which K through 12 schooling can, you know, because not everyone goes to college, right? And so thinking about this as, as a workforce development issue, right? Like, there would be probably less sexual harassment in the workforce, again, if people got those kindergarten level messages about keeping their hands on their own bodies. And so I think bringing in employers, bringing in the insurance industry, which pays out huge amounts of money every year for lawsuits related to sexual harassment and assault. So like, I think we're really, and this is the privilege of, of being a tenured professor, like I, we really want to do the policy translation work. Um, and, um, when the paperback comes out in the end of January, we have you know a whole other series of events lined up. So we're we're in it, um, you know, for for a while. And then I think the other thing that we're interested in scientifically, you know, it, it's a little bit ironic, but given how attentive we are to social context, like the thing that you can't see in sexual citizens is how variation in social context produces different patterns of sexual assault because other than walking across Broadway, like we're basically working in one campus environment. And so I'm very interested in, um, not necessarily in myself spending time on other campuses, but in, in finding colleagues who are doing similar work. Hello, App State. Like if you, you know, I think that finding other universities that are willing to throw down and do this kind of in-depth research so that we can build a knowledge base that would allow us to compare would be great. And I think, and that includes the flagship universities in the global south, where there um, is evidence of very high rates of sexual harassment of students by professors. Um, and I think that there's a, there are real research gaps. And, you know, those are such an incredible vehicle for social mobility for women. And so I think that, that, that attending more to less privileged con contexts, whether it's the, the Global South or community colleges. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of research that I would like to do, but I think I'm also acutely aware of um, the goal of doing something with the research. Great. Um, th that's fantastic. I like, I like this blend of kind of taking, you know, moving with some of the policy and also, and maybe doing some cross institutional research. That, that's brilliant. Um, we, we have a question from McGregor. Um, what do you think, do you think that there's a way to inform the, and educate the public about some of the issues about sexual assault on campus? So we were scheduled to be on Morning Joe the day the book came out, and then we were bumped because it was the first day of the impeachment hearings. Um, and I think that like leveraging media, so you know, most of America does not listen to NPR. And so it was super exciting to be on All Things Considered and like 
mostly people didn't hear that. And so I think op-eds, TV, like I'm dying to be on The View. If anyone here knows anyone who would like is a booker on The View, like I, I, I think that reaching people USA Today, reaching people where they are and um, communicating in accessible language about this being an everyone problem and that means that we are all stakeholders and we can all do something to be part of the solution. I think that, that most academics, you know, they teach you to produce information, but they don't teach you to, to do anything good with that information. And I think Seamus and I um, both really enjoy the public communication side of it. And so I think that like to educate the public involves like going out to meet the public. So we are available. That's, that's like we will speak at any church or community group that invites us, literally. <laughs> Great. I, I think that's brilliant just to um, kind of have a multi-pronged kind of way to reach the public. I, I think we can maybe fit in one more audience question, and that's from Samantha Kramer. And I think that this is, a, this is an interesting question. I, I think I know that Columbia has an active Greek life, and, and Appalachian State does too. And so Samantha asked, do you have specific recommendations for holding Greek life individuals accountable for sexual assault and their role in rape culture on college campuses. So, I, you know, I'm, I don't want to be disappointing to Samantha in the way that I answer this question. Um, we really are not focused on adjudication, both because we're not lawyers and because such a small proportion of cases are reported. We also found that there is um, as much variability within Greek life in terms of their social power and prestige and their, their relative rapiness as there is across the campus. And so I think that we, um, <clears throat> I don't want to, certainly there are assaults that happen within Greek life. And there are also assaults that happen in the band and in the French club. And I think that ultimately, um, every student organization needs to commit to a culture change, whether it's, you know, Greek life or the Poetry Society. Um, they all, and, you know, I think it's, those are, um, uh, they become students' families on campus. And so they're both the easiest, like the most logical place to find prospective sexual partners and the most dangerous place to find prospective sexual partners because if someone hurts someone else, it's very hard to call that out because it's like losing your whole family, right? It's, it's, in some ways, it's very reminiscent to me of the reason that it's hard for incest survivors to talk about it. And so I think that self, like, Self-regulating, which means having explicit conversations about community norms, sort of that, that more proactive bystander work is really important. Um, again, I go back to the prevention. I'm going to leave the adjudication to the people who are specialists in that. And I think that, Samantha, your question is really is, is important. Um, it's just not exactly where we are in our research. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jennifer. And, and I, I just want to, at this time, um, I want to make one more plug for sexual citizens. If, if you have not um, picked up a copy of this book, I, I recommend doing so. The, as Jennifer mentioned, the, the paperback version is coming out soon. So pick up a copy. Uh, it's excellent. Uh, it's, it's, it's just really informative and, and really um, deep and rich with a lot of you know, interesting stories that make you think. Uh, so I, I just, I can't thank you enough uh, Jennifer for joining us today and I'm also thankful to Mar uh, Dr. McCoy for uh, helping me co-facilitate this discussion and for all of you for attending our symposium today. Th thank you so much. Um, I, I believe that uh, Nancy we're going to take a little break uh, for, for lunch. Yes we are. We will resume at one o'clock for our next session with Dr. Michael Roth. Okay, well, thank you so much. This has really been such a delight. Uh, Martha, David, I really enjoyed speaking with you about the book. Um, it, it's always particularly fun to um, be in conversation with people about the book who have actually read it, um, but also who read it with such, um, such perception. So, so thank you so much for, for, for a great conversation. Thank you. Thank you. See you at one o'clock. <laughs>